Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. Please welcome Steve Pollack back to Radnor Memorial Library and enjoy the Red Rose Girls. Thank you. Well, just to give a little, a little preamble to what we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, if you think that what you were coming here tonight to look at were pictures done by local artists, we'll do some of that. But my primary interest uh, in the Red Rose Girls really stems from my interest originally in something called the Golden Age of Illustration. Is anybody familiar with that? What's the Golden Age of Illustration? Absolutely. Okay. NCYF and, and his contemporaries. So a period between, say, 1880 and 1930, when illustration became a form of art that was enabled by the new kind of mass media that, uh, that came about after the Civil War to be driven to people as the United States expanded from east to west. And we'll talk about this more in depth in a little bit, but, uh, but I'm sure you're familiar with magazines like Harper's, Harper's Weekly. Uh, that was very, very important during the Civil War to correspondence. What was going on during the Civil War? What was happening? And Harper's was able, now that there were new offset lith lithograph processes that had been invented to send all kinds of publications out in mass. And it really is the beginning of we, what we know today as mass media on a different scale, on a printed scale. But what they found was that people loved the illustrations that were in the periodicals. Not only did they love the news that they were getting, that was very important for them to have, but the illustrations were really important. Now, if you notice here, what we're really going to look at first, but I'll spend some time in the beginning of this talk uh, discussing, and by the way, feel free if you have any questions or if there are comments that you want to make, uh, you know, that come to mind during the discussion, please feel free to, to ask, but please try to speak up, and uh, I'll repeat your questions so that, uh, or comment so that everybody can hear or laugh or whatever. So, the new woman. We, we talked about the golden age of illustration. The new woman. Is anybody familiar with that term? What, what was the new woman. <laughs> Pull up your ears, cigarettes. Pull up your ear. All right. It, it, developed, it developed into that. Uh, that was really something that happened in the 1920s that we associate with what we call flappers. <laughs> and flappers really were a development of things that came after World War I when after women had gotten the vote in the United States, when there was this sigh of relief that the war was over, that all these terrible things that had happened in Europe were done, and there was an economic boom that lasted for about nine years. But the new woman was the continuation of a movement that, that was developing in the 19th century especially during the Victorian age, where women began to declare an autonomous life for themselves, a life away from, away from the abuse of men, a life away from the abuse of the Victorian era, from the mores and, and the extremes of the strict behavior that, that culture had, had really pressed upon women. Um, and many women in the United States, actually in the United States, 
probably the most, the, the highest level of drug abuse was by women who suffered from depression in the Midwest. You know, in the late 19th century, you could order syringes directly from the Sears catalog. Now, if that sounds odd, uh, it, by today's standards, it's only odd because we don't allow it. But by their standards, it was sort of a thing that, that they were able to do. So the new woman, we'll look at that. Romantic friendship. Anybody familiar with ro what romantic friendship is about? Someone's shaking their head. Is that, no. yes, you're letting the marbles loose or? or <laughs> you, so, I'm sorry, speak, speak up. Speaking of women, I hope I'm in the right century there. Rita Sacco, West, Kate Chopin, just women writers, um, now I'm thinking about women getting the right to vote. Well, all, all right, it, it's sort of linked to that. But more than that, there was, in this era, in this Victorian era especially, there was an element of a practice when women were able to go to women's schools, like Vassar and Smith and those sorts of schools, it was a practice of separating men and women. Now, men and women had been separated now because of the age of empire. Men were out building nations. By the time World War I started, 80% of the world was controlled by five or six European countries. You can name them, England, France, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, owned, or had colonized 80% of the world. Now, if you think of, about that for a second, where were all the men going? They were stationed places. They were building nations. This was a very muscular, muscular activity. Women weren't involved. Women were left to do what? Take care of the house, take care of children, do what the man said. Right? So, in these colleges, when women finally started to have opportunities to get education on their own, <coughs> and especially young women of some means, the colleges encouraged relationships between young girls that aggressive girls would take the male part and make friendships with freshmen, less aggressive girls, and, and behave in ways that created very, very intimate relationships, some of them, of course, eventually leading to sexual relationships. And it was fairly well accepted because it was thought of to be harmless, especially in the Victorian age. Now, how does this affect Philadelphia? <coughs> well, that's what we're going to talk about. And that's how we're going to see how these red rose girls fit into the culture of the world at that time. So the new woman, as I said, during the, the, the end part of the 19th century, more and more women began to, began to want to claim their own turf. They wanted to be free and autonomous um, and not be under the thumb of men. There were probably, oh, around 1860, maybe at the time of the Civil War, um, six and a half percent of the non-agrarian workforce was female. By the time we get to 1920, it had doubled. And then it just staggeringly exponentially increases more and more and more. But really, this was, this was mostly for women of some means. Um, the United States and England were most involved in this, but there was some residue of this happening in Germany and France and other European countries. 
these colleges, the Seven Sisters Colleges, especially in this area, we know something about them, right? Bryn Mawr College, um, familiar with Barnard, right? Radcliffe, Mount Holyoke, Vassar, Smith, and Wellesley. Anybody go to those schools? Uh huh. They're different now than they were before, right? Um, an example, an example of the new woman, this woman up in the top right, Frances Benjamin Johnston. Um, here, she, here she is smoking a cigarette in a very aggressive pose in the, in, the, in the 1890s. And there she is wearing male clothes with a bicycle. Uh, in addition to, in addition to, uh, to her, uh, familiar with uh, a woman named Misha Sert, Misha Sert, Gertrude Stein. Misha Sert was was a uh, a patron of the arts and a party thrower. Uh, people like Toulouse Lautrec used to show up at her house and bartend for parties where where, where Debussy attended and and all of the late uh, Stefan Mallarmé and all of the impressionists and. They would hang out and talk about art and, and love and whatever the French talk about, I don't know. So she was very, very friendly with Coco Chanel. And the two of them very famously had many, many photographs taken of each other wearing mustache, wearing men's clothes, hanging out on the beach together, arms around each other. It was a very, very affectionate relationship. So, a lot of famous authors at this time started to note what was happening with women. Um, Sarah Grand was an Irish writer, um, and she sort of coined this new word, new woman, in, in an article that she wrote about women's freedoms and women's autonomy. And she had a discussion in articles with another female writer named Louisa Ram. Uh, and then Henry James picked up on it. Henry James used the phrase new woman uh, to describe what was this big increase in, in new educated women who came from the middle class. Now, Henry James's novels are about free-thinking women who often travel to Europe, do what they want away from chaperone, yes? Which, that shouldn't be done, correct? It wouldn't be done, it wouldn't be done in, in a novel written 100 years before, or even 70 years before. Um, and uh, Henrik Ibsen, Anybody familiar with the writings of Henrik Ibsen? Have you read A Doll's House or Hedda Gabler? Are those women strong? Are they, are they aggressive? Yeah, they are. Um, uh, Ibsen's works were, had such an effect on women's movements that in 1888, the Norwegian Women's Rights League gave a banquet in his honor. Um, and uh, Max Beerbohm, the famous critic and author, said, the new woman sprang fully armed from Ibsen's brain. So it w really was a term that, that was commonly used. George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw um, highlighted issues about women's uh, rights in his, in his work, Mrs. Warren's Profession. Anybody ever read that? Mrs. Warren's profession. What do you think Mrs. Warren's profession was? She was a madam. She was a madam, and the issue is how does she <laughs> deal with her daughter who is trying to understand what her mother does for a living? Um, Candida, uh, another example. Uh, well, it'll, it'll come to me in a moment. But there's Bernard Shaw. Ibsen, there's Sarah Grant. Bram Stoker mentions the new woman 
in Dracula. And, and the heroine, Lucy, Lucy is the woman who gets bitten. Lucy is a detective, and she tries to figure out by deduction. Why is that important? Why is it important that a woman tries to figure out by deduction something? Because logical, rational thinking, logical, rational reasoning is the realm of men, not the realm of women. Women's realm is the realm of what? Of emotion. But Lucy tries to reason out what's happening. She becomes a detective. That's a little bit different. Um, familiar with the Gibson girls? Charles Dana Gibson? Um, now, the YWCA, the YWCA became very, very strongly supportive of, uh, of women and their self-esteem. Familiar with Nellie Bly? Nellie Bly, a journalist. And she traveled around the world in 72 days. Not only did she do that, she took it upon herself to pretend that she was insane so that she could gain entry to discover what was happening in the corrupt, insane asylums near where she was. She's a pretty brave woman. Um, so these kinds of inspiring things that women were doing was, was really important. It had great impact on people. Um, laws during the 19th century started to change little by little as well. Uh, what is, anybody know what breach of, breach of contract is? What is breach of contract? Right. It used to be that if a man engaged a woman to be married and broke off the engagement for a suspicious reason, that she could sue him for breach of promise or breach of contract. And when some, actually, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan wrote a very, uh, a very funny show called Trial by Jury, which is all about breach of of promise or breach of contract. But laws changed little by little because if a woman was divorced, then what means did she have to survive that divorce? There were no laws that demanded alimony. There were no laws that demanded that she have protection to take care of the children. The man had all of the laws in his defense. So these things started to change little by little, and women began to recognize that if they got divorced, they might be able to survive that, and they might be able to find and enter a new relationship. Does this make sense so far? Um, if you want a good laugh, around this time, there also sprang up a women's division of the Ku Klux Klan. This picture here is a picture of the women's branch of the KKK in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's Nellie Bly, by the way, and that's Bram Stoker. Um, the people who were, who were trying to suppress this idea of the new, wom uh, the new woman uh, for many different reasons, um, moral reasons, family reasons, sexual reasons, uh, and cultural reasons were the Catholic Church that said that this was wrong, that this was turning the rules of nature upside down, that women shouldn't have this role. Also, one of our best friends, Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud, who said, well, I have studied women for so many years, and I still don't know what they want. <laughs> well, we all know that so many things that Freud said were so true and important when it comes to the subconscious and fears and sexuality and all that stuff. But when it came to women, 
I think he was an idiot. One of the Red Rose girls is a woman named Jessie Wilcox Smith. Anybody familiar with that name? Yes? In what way are you familiar with her? An illustrator. What kind of stuff did she illustrate mostly? What is she famous for? Saturday Evening Post. Saturday Evening Post, okay, yes. Yes, that's true. You were going to say something? I have a copy of one of her magazines. One of her magazines? Children's books. Children's books. Um, so, uh, born in Philadelphia uh, on South 41st Street, which is kind of like University City, right? Um, and uh, her parents uh, had enough means to send her to school in Cincinnati, where she stayed with her cousin. Um, and they weren't really wealthy, but, uh, uh, but not, they didn't have enough money to support an art career for her. Um, and while she, was in, um, while she was in Cincinnati, a friend of hers decided to take art lessons from a young man that, that they knew. And she had to go along as the chaperone in order to protect her friend's virtue. So she went as the chaperone, and she was watching the drawing lesson, and she decides, oh, I'd like to try some of that too. So she did, and then she showed her drawings that, that she was practicing to some other people, and they said, aha, you have talent. You should pursue this. She wasn't really... She wasn't really quite sure how to do it. And when she graduated from school, she had embarked on a career to be a kindergarten teacher. That didn't work at all. She found herself impatient. She didn't like screaming kids around her all the time. Um, and she really decided uh, that maybe it would be better for her, instead of to pursue this kindergarten teacher kind of thing, to find a way to go to art school. So she did, oh, by, and by the way, those are two different photos of her. Um, so where did she go? She went to the Philadelphia School of Design for Women. Um, and that really was because it was very inexpensive to go. But she was talented enough to recognize that the things that they were teaching her were below her level. And the other women who were attending the classes with her weren't that serious about learning art. They were kind of having fun and getting through things, and it was not really the atmosphere that she wanted. So she switched, and she went to the Academy of Fine Arts. And guess who is there? Cecilia Bow, Thomas Aikens, uh, all those people. Um, and she studied with another famous artist at the time named Thomas Anschutz, who is uh, also known as Thomas Pollock. It's a great name, isn't it? <laughs> Except P-O-L-L-O-C-K, like Jackson. So. When Eakins was dismissed from the academy, um, she kept on studying with Anschutz, um, and then she graduated from the academy and took an entry-level job working for an advertising, um, in the advertising department for the Ladies' Home Journal, which was here in <coughs> Philadelphia. It wasn't in Boston. It was in Philadelphia. So... Um, she then moved from the academy after graduating. She gravitated over to Drexel. And she found that there was this wonderful instructor named Howard Pyle. And she went to take classes with him. And that's where she eventually met up with Violet Oakley and Elizabeth Shippen Green, who we'll look at uh, next. Howard Pyle noticed that the work of 
Jesse Wilcox Smith and Violet Oakley had some neat similarities. And he recommended them to a publisher that he knew to work on a project for uh, illustrations for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Evangeline. And he set them up with a job together. <clears throat> and this is what I me meant by Pyle being so generous. He actually sort of was acting like an, an agent or a manager for many of his students who had talent. Um, once she got this job, and she was doing other little things, freelance, she decided that she could afford a small place to live. And she got a place in Philadelphia on 1334 Chestnut Street. It was very, very small, but big enough for what she needed to do. And it was close to where she had to walk to get to work at the Ladies' Home Journal. In the Victorian age, it was almost unheard of to be both female and an illustrator. But there are always exceptions that prove the rule. And Jessie Wilcox Smith was easily the best known and most successful of those exceptions. She had worked as a kindergarten teacher had to give it up because of persistent back pain, at which point she went on to study art in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania before getting a job in the advertisement department of the Ladies' Home Journal. I just said that. She stayed at the journal for five years before turning freelance, and as the new century rolled around, she found herself increasingly in demand. In 1903, she secured a particularly lucrative long-term contract with the highly regarded Collier's she was one of only a handful of illustrators, all the others being men, of course, commissioned by the magazine. Soon, other publishers joined her list of clients, including Scribner's, for whom she produced a series of watercolour paintings on what was rapidly becoming her trademark theme, evocations of childhood. And as if to seal her reputation in that regard, she was the driving force behind the book, The Seven Ages of Childhood first published in 1909. Jessie Wilcox Smith was by now amongst the top three or four illustrators working in America, and the prestigious commissions kept rolling in. In 1915, Louisa May Alcott's Little Women was published, with a series of suitably sentimental and evocative illustrations by Wilcox Smith. And only a year later, her uncharacteristically moody and occasionally sinister illustrations Charles Kingsley's book, The Water Babies, were published. Around the same time, she was commissioned to illustrate all the covers for Good Housekeeping, and continued to do so for 17 years until 1933. Her work for the book, The Princess and the Goblin, in 1920, to remind you of Maxfield Parish, the Water Babies, and demonstrated that she could, as the job called for her, illustrate more than just contemporary American childhood. Nevertheless, she returned to her comfort zone with a range of charming colour and monochrome images for the children's novel Heidi in 1922. Early on in her career, Wilcox Smith had made use of fairly bold outlines and flattish colours in a Japanese-influenced approach popular with quite a few illustrators of the time. But she left that behind in later work, and although she used a broad range and combination of media, she was evidently most comfortable and adept with watercolour. Jessie Wilcox Smith continued to illustrate for commercial clients into her later years, but from the mid-1920s onward, she turned increasingly to what she thought of as proper art, in the form of a series of rather bland commissioned portraits, <coughs> particularly of the children of the very wealthy, before her frail health finally got the better of her in 1935. Now that's just the beginning for Jesse Wilcox Smith. Elizabeth Shippen Green, born in Philadelphia. Her family was pretty well connected, though not rich. Um, she attended the Academy of Fine Arts, and she worked with Thomas Eakins and Thomas Anschutz. Um, now, the Academy was ki kind of a dark place. It wasn't really that well lit. It had a gloomy kind of an atmosphere. Elizabeth Shippen Green was very short and sprightly. She had a great sense of humor, 
she loved life and she was very active, it wasn't the place for her. She really, really was a little, a little put off by it. Um, and where did she go? She went to Drexel and she met Howard Pyle. Well, uh, her father had been an artist. Her father had worked for Harper's as a war correspondent and as an artist. And during the Civil War, he would scribble illustrations and, and stories of the Civil War. And he, uh, he made quite a good living doing that. He was also a wood carver. Um, and their, uh, their family had Quaker background. Does that seem odd for Philadelphia? Hmm. Um, but uh, uh, sh her, her family, her ancestry went back in history. Her, uh, I guess her great-grandfather had been the mayor of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, his name was Matthew Clarkson. And, um, and she had an uncle who was in the Pennsylvania State Legislature for some years. Um, well, the family, that's her father. That's a, a, a portrait that she did of, or a drawing that she did of her father. Um, they had enough money to try to give her the best that they could for her education. Um, and she really, really was interested in art. But she was interested in illustration. She wasn't headed for fine art. She really loved illustration. She knew that that's what she wanted to do. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, she, was, she had a great sense of humor and she was very, very witty and conversational and lively, unlike the two friends that she met up with. Jesse Wilcox Smith was, was very proper and very stern and Violet Oakley was so passionate and intense about what she wanted to do. Eventually, she kind of went overboard with her uh, religious and, um, and political feelings. Um, so Elizabeth Ship and Green, uh, here are a couple of samples of line drawing that she was capable of and art that she was capable of. Pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? It's quite beautiful. Um, so she began contributing to a publication called the Philadelphia Times. Uh, and she was doing little line drawings for them. Uh, it, it, she got some money for freelance stuff, but it didn't pay the rent very well. So she started to do more intricate things. She knew that she had to do better and grander things to get uh, bigger commissions. Um, so when she was 19 years old, she got her first cover uh, produced on what was called Jester magazine. And that brought her to a little bit of prominence. Um, she then graduated from the uh, academy in 1893. However, her sister, Catherine, died. Um, and that set her back emotionally a little bit. But she decided to bury herself in her work, and she became a regular contributor to the uh, publication of the Philadelphia Public uh, Ledger. Uh, but still, very, very immature form of art for her. Here are some samples of her art. Can you see the, the influence of Howard Pyle in those, like Robin Hood, Kate Greenaway? More than any of the artists, she had the strongest connection to Maxfield Parrish.
That's a sample. I have, we'll look at a few more in, in bigger renderings. Violet Oakley, the third of the, of the women, was born in New Jersey. Some, some uh, history books will tell you she was born in New York. There seems to be some discrepancy there, but most say that she was born in Bergen Heights, which is kind of near Jersey City. Um, she came from a long line of artists, or, or her family, uh, almost everybody was interested in art. Her paternal, maternal grandfather, they were both artists. Her, uh, her dad was interested in art. Um, she had two aunts who were, who were artists. Um, one of them was going to become a professional artist, but, but she met a Russian nobleman who was an expatriate, fell in love with him, and lived with him in Paris. Um, that's important because when Violet eventually went to Paris, they went to visit her, her aunt who had a place. Um, and she was obviously very, very proud of what she called her goodly heritage. Um, she had an older sister named Hester, uh, and Hester went to Vassar, but because her other sister, Cornelia, everybody called Nellie, was very ill and died at a, at when Violet was uh, a baby, her parents were extremely concerned for Violet's health because she had asthma and she had other kinds of of problems and they were afraid to let her go out on her own, let her go out in the cold, and she really wasn't allowed to do much of anything until after she was 20. Um, so when she was finally allowed in 1894, where did she go? Drexel. Um, so at first though, she used to travel to New York when her dad said, uh, said that it was okay for her to study art. They would travel to New York and they went to the Art Students League. Anybody know what famous uh, illustrators came from the Art Students League in New York? Maxfield Parrish, Norman Rockwell. So um, can you see how the connections all, all sort of mold together. All these people knew each other. They, were, they all knew who each other were. Um, so she went to Europe, visited her aunt, uh, and while she was there, they, you know, she took some, uh, some art classes, both in Paris and, uh, and in England. Uh, as I said, she was very passionate and intense. She was also known for having a temper. Um, so her dad got extremely ill. His, his health was always on the brink. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, in 1897, that's when she went to Howard Powell's class. Um, she was so meticulous, she was so nervous about getting into Powell's class that she worked for weeks on getting her drawings together and making sure everything was right. And then she showed him her portfolio and he said, I think I can help you. So she got into his class, and guess who was there? Well, the other two women. And another artist, another young artist named Jesse Dodd, who, who was an artist of some note, eventually left when she saw that she couldn't keep up with these three. Um, so they, she and her sister, her sister wrote a book which had gotten published and was getting some press. And her sister wanted to write more and more. Eventually her sister got married and, and stopped writing with that enthusiasm. But they picked up a place on 1523 Chestnut Street. And that place had three rooms. It was spacious. It had skylights that allowed lots of natural light. And she was able to set up a studio for herself there. Um, she was especially shy, and here's some information about her. Violet Oakley is the quintessential Philadelphian. She was a lifelong pacifist. She was an activist. She valued our democratic society. Violet Oakley is a girl. 
great artist, and she's even more a fascinating figure. We come out of this wonderful tradition of muralism. I remember as a young artist in the city looking at the work of Violet Oakley and thinking that there was real history and tradition here, that really creating murals in the city of Philadelphia in the 80s was sort of a natural progression of things that came before. Violet Oakley moved to Philadelphia in 1896 in order to study at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and also because her father had suffered a nervous breakdown. Philadelphia was not only a center of the arts in the late 19th century, but was a medical center. Unfortunately for Violet Oakley, her father did not recover and maintaining him in a mental institution exhausted the remainder of Courtney's funds. As a result, she could no longer attend the academy. She needed to do something where she could earn money much more quickly. She enrolls in Howard Pyle's new school at Drexel. Pyle was teaching a group of women to be illustrators. That was something that women could do and do successfully. When it came to women in the profession of the arts, it was assumed that women could handle work that was small. There was general discrimination in the art world. The more masculine ideas of painting in oil or mural painting was not an acceptable concept for women. No one could conceive of women dressing any other way than in piles of cloth and dresses that went down their ankles. It was deemed that you had to have a lot of physical strength and stamina to be how could a woman work on scaffolding dressed like that? Her instructor at the path bus is... Get the idea? Violet Oakley was an illustrator, but we'll see, she drifted into what became incredible mural paintings. Who do we know in history was famous for mural paintings? Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, Donatello, yes? So, uh, if you're not aware, uh, her incredible mural paintings are in the state capitol in Harrisburg. Has anybody ever seen them? The Senate and the, yes? Okay, the Supreme Court and in the governor's uh, entrance and, and in stained glass. So, now let's turn our attention to the Red Rose Girls. We know they all met at whose studio? Howard Pyle. Howard Pyle. <laughs> right. So uh, this studio that Violet had, and there's a photo of her in her, in her studio on 1534 Chestnut Street, um, it was pretty nicely lit. Now remember, Violet and Jesse Wilcox Smith got put together by Howard Pyle to work on, on illustrations for Evangeline. Jesse got interested, well, where are you drawing? Well, where are you living and what are you doing? Of course, they're talking. And Violet says, well, I got this nice place and I'm living with my sister and my sister's an author and blah, 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 blah. Why don't you come with us? There you have it. So Jesse Wilcox Smith moves in. She moves in and then soon after, Violet's sister Hester moves out. So who else moves in? Elizabeth. Elizabeth and another and another friend named Jesse Dodd. Now Jesse really wanted to be an artist, but she recognized after a while that she just could not keep up with these other girls. Um, and uh, Evangeline uh, eventually created great success for them. That, this is a photo of what the Red Rose Inn looked like. We'll get to how they got there in just a few moments. And there's Violet in her studio at the Red Rose Inn. Here are a couple of the illustrations, samples from Evangeline. This is Jesse Wilcox Smith. 
And you see down here her signature, JWS. You see that on uh, many of her uh, uh, paintings. And this is, whoops, and that's Violet Oakley's. Little bit, little bit different, but you see how the lighting that they use is very similar. They're still kind of growing and maturing together. Uh, so in Philadelphia, there was a club that was growing up. It was women who were supporting the arts and supporting each other in the arts, and they called it the Plastic Club. Plastic not meaning plastic like the plastic meaning malleable things that, that would become art. Um, so uh, so they, they joined this club and they were lifelong members and enthusiasts. It's still here today. You can look it up and see there are still many active members in the plastic club, uh, although now it, it has some men involved in it. Um, so little by little, they started to get more commissions for things, and they, they were getting commissions from, from uh, periodicals like Scribner's and Harper's and Harper's Bazaar. Uh, Violet started to experiment with murals. Now, guess who took the key from Violet to work on murals? Howard Pyle. Howard Pyle also started working on murals and was very inspired <coughs> by what Violet was doing. I think they both inspired each other. Um, then um, Elizabeth Shippen Green started to get work from the Saturday Evening Post, which came from what city? Oh, okay. I thought you said that. I heard, hadn't heard anybody say anything about Boston yet. Um, Scholars Magazine, St. Nicholas, and, um, and she, she got some of her work put into a collection of works that included Maxfield Parrish, Edward Austin Abbey, Howard Pyle, and her. Can you imagine how exciting that was for her? So they started to get pretty successful. Um, now, this is where it gets critical. Howard Pyle had told these girls that once a woman is married, that's the end of her professionally. Any you women ever heard that in your life before? So if somebody asked, when did the Victorian age end? <laughs> well, OK. Uh, Anna, Anna Leah Merritt was uh, the, one of the members of, prominent members of the Plastic Club. Uh, and she wrote in Lippen, Lippincott's, the chief obstacle to a woman's success is that she can never have a wife. Does that sound odd? No, no it doesn't sound odd. Um, well, they, these three girls had this common humanity with them. They were inspired. They inspired each other. They talked about their art. They were commissioned on things together. They really they started to make each other do better things. And they became almost inseparable. Um, now, once they became more celebrities, because people knew who they were and started to know what their, what their art was, they started to get people ringing their bell all the time. You know, buy this, buy that, are you, are you Jesse Wilcox Smith, and blah, blah, blah. But on top of that, guess what? Elizabeth Shippen Green was a flirt. And a lot of her boyfriends would would try to come around and they were bothersome. So they decided this city stuff is too cloying, it's too suffocating. Let's find a place like the English have and find a place where we can have some fresh air and freedom and space. And where do you think they went? They went to Villanova. They went to Villanova. And this fellow, Frederick Phillips, owned the estate at the time. And he decided there was a place in England called Stoke Pogis. Anybody ever heard of that? An artist's community, an artist's colony. And 
He thought that he was going to take this estate that was left to him and create an artist colony right here in Villanova. What do you think the, the neighbors said? Not on your life, boy. Can I hold your palm olive? Not on your life, boy. And I guess I'm out of luck. Uh, those are old soap jokes. All right. So anyway, the contentious neighbor complaints said, no, no art colonies here. We don't want these lowlifes in our community. Um, but it was then purchased by Anthony Drexel. I think he purchased it for about $200,000 at the time. And he renovated the inn and he rented it to the girls. They could afford it. They were getting good commissions. They figured out a way to do it. But, but they were joined by a fourth woman. Her name was Henrietta Cozens. Now, Henrietta <laughs> wasn't an artist. She wasn't really a scholar. She was a friend of Jesse Wilcox Smith's. She agreed to do all the housework, cook all the meals, take care of the gardening, take care of them, do all the shopping. <laughs> they found a wife. They found a, a communal wife. Does, does that make sense? So, so the four of them got, now Jesse Wilcox Smith had a special bond with Henrietta for their entire life. The, the writings that they have back and forth are, are just so, you would not know the difference between the writings between these two women and the writings, uh, the writings of Hudson's art. She also was an artist. Uh, that's a self-portrait by Violet. There's Elizabeth Ship and Green. There's UG. And there's a portrait that Violet made of Henrietta. And there's Jesse Wilcox Smith. There they are again. And remember I was talking about romantic friendships. This sort of photograph, this sort of pose for two women is not unusual, doesn't seem unusual, does it? But in light of their relationship, can you see how wonderfully close they were? I mean, there, there is such an element of, uh, of love and adoration between the two of them that it's, it, it's really striking. Yes? How many years were they at Red Rose and how many years at Cox? They were at Red Rose for about five years, uh, for oh, six, almost six years, and then Cogsley, they were in Cogsley until shortly after 1911, so another six years, something, something like that. Then they sort of split up. Here is part, part <coughs> of a mural by Violet Oakley. And I don't know if you can see her here, but here she is dwarfed, dwarfed by the mural that she's creating. This is the female, the female image of wisdom. Now, on the left here, on the left here is wisdom. The waters of wisdom come, come down, and people can partake of the waters of wisdom. There's an old Quaker legend on, on the left that said if they left their doors unlocked, that the Native Americans would leave them alone, that the Native Americans would not attack them, that it was a locked door that signified something anti-friendship, something anti-human. And that legend in, in Quaker uh, lore is over there on the left. And over on the right is symbolic of the Quakers who bought a slave ship in order to set the slaves free. Some of, the, some of her ideas were not well received by people in the legislature or by people who were commissioning the art. They didn't want those, those images uh, to corrupt what they thought was acceptable in, um, in the statehouse. 
So here is William Penn with his vision, one of many. Eventually, she, she created over 43 murals in the Capitol in Harrisburg. Huge, though. Absolutely huge. The, I don't think, here's a sample of her stained glass. Um, and this, the mural after mural after mural after mural after mural, all through the governor's reception hall in Harrisburg. And it, it's hard to see, but, uh, but it's, it's a body of work that's just, it's just amazing and it was given to a woman. Now, in addition to that, um, uh, she then took for $100,000 another commission to do the Senate chambers and the Supreme Court. Uh, and she also did the, the, uh, the uh, State House in Minneapolis. Did she have friends who helped her? Some. But she, she worked on it mostly on her own. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Shipp and Green. The, I'm sorry, this is Violet Oakley also. This is Elizabeth Shipp and Green. Can you see the influence of Maxfield Parish? Here's another. This is called The Five Little Pigs. And this was an ad, an ad that she created for Kodak. So he's posing the little lamb for a picture. Or is it slaughtered? I don't know. Now, remember I told you about photographs? So here is Jesse Wilcox Smith posing with some guy, the men aren't important. Um, and this eventually becomes this. So it's a photograph for photograph of reference. Is that No. No, it's, it, even the descriptions say unidentified man. Um, Jesse Wilcox Smith, some samples. Children. Children, children, just these are, are my favorites. These are my favorites in the in the entire body of of work that I that I look at. I just they're so they're so emotional for me. They really are. Um, this I, I forget the exact title, but this is something like uh, standing behind her. Um, I reach over and fix her, fix her dress or something like that. But it, it's just, it's amazingly striking. If Howard Pyle had been a woman, that's what he would have created. By the way, <coughs> anybody ever see Pirates of the Caribbean? Pirates of the Caribbean, all the Disney things, the pirates that, that they're all based on how Howard Pyle created pirate costumes. See the costumes? Howard Pyle costumes. Um, <clears throat> child, and, and this one just absolutely gets me. We all have those moments, don't we? Jesse Wilcox Smith, here's a reference photo. And there's the goldfish bowl. And that's, that's what I have. Uh, these are some other artists of the time. Kate Greenaway, very influential. Aubrey Beardsley. OK? So I'm sorry to take so long, but thank you.